We tend to think of outlaws as folk heroes, like Jesse James, Billy the Kid, or Bonnie and Clyde. But the true stories of these figures are more complicated, including how some of them hung up their spurs and wound up working on the right side of the law, or sometimes both sides at once. Today, we're taking a look at some infamous outlaws who wound up working for the man. But before we get started, make sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel. And don't forget to leave a comment and let us know what other notorious characters you would like to hear about. Okay, time to swap that black hat for a white one. Born Doroteo Arango in 1878, the man who would become Pancho Villa ran into trouble at the age of 16 when he shot a man who allegedly assaulted his sister. Afterward, Arango fled to the mountains as a fugitive. He was forced to join the Mexican army, but escaped shortly after that. He journeyed to Chihuahua, where he became a cattle rustler and changed his name to Francisco Villa. Villa lived as a bandit until he joined Francisco Madero's rebellion against the dictatorial Mexican president Porfirio Diaz. Villa fiercely battled on behalf of Mexico's citizenry. He printed currency, distributed land, and recruited for the new army, eventually leading several campaigns in the uprising. He was a champion of guerrilla warfare and ultimately drew the attention of the United States military after a battle that slew more than 30 Americans. Villa was appointed governor of Chihuahua in 1913, but continued his rebellious efforts. Eventually, Madero took power, but was subsequently deposed in a separate rebellion. Being the president was a pretty temporary gig at the time. After his buddy got the boot, Villa became an outlaw once again. He spent his time between the United States and Mexico, formed his own patrol called División del Norte, and was eventually pardoned by Mexico's new leader, Adolfo de la Huerta, in 1920. Pancho Villa's time on the right side of the law didn't last, however, as he was taken out by assassins only three years later. Born in India in 1963 to a poor family, Hulin Devi was sold into marriage when she was just a young child, only to be returned by her abusive husband after one year. As a teenager, Devi started running with a band of dacoits, or bandits. The gang's leader abused her until another member, Vikram Mala, took him out and made Devi his gang wife. It was a match that worked. Together, the couple and their gang went on a spree of murder, abduction, and robbery that tore through India in the late 1970s. Another member of the gang whacked Vikram in 1980, leaving Devi to be brutalized for several weeks before she escaped and formed a new group. Devi and her new gang got revenge by offing 22 men from the village where she had been imprisoned. She became known as a legendary bandit queen for her exploits, because that's a story that gets around. She stayed on the run for two years until she was finally forced to surrender to authorities. After serving 11 years in prison, all the charges against Devi were withdrawn. That's a lucky break. She became a Buddhist and embraced a more peaceful path, emerging as a prominent figure in Indian politics. Devi even managed to get elected to parliament, twice. But her redemption arc was short-lived, as she was gunned down during her second term in 2001 by men seeking revenge for her dark deeds. Turns out you can't bury two dozen people and then just walk away. Motorcycle gangs like the Hells Angels, the Outlaws, and the Banditos were a major force in America during the 1970s. They were kind of like the mob, if the mob rode Harleys and wore pounds of leather. They were so much like the mob, in fact, that the FBI ranked motorcycle gangs among the most serious organized crime groups in the U.S. Wayne Big Chuck Bradshaw was a big player in an outlaw motorcycle club known as the Pagans. Ah, the Pagans. Wonder if they were really into astrology. Following a deadly bar fight in which he slashed and pummeled five members of a rival gang, Bradshaw lost his taste for the lifestyle. Deciding to put fighting behind him, he went to work as a police informant in 1977 and eventually became an undercover narcotics officer. Initially, his rough riding past earned him many mistrustful glances from his new colleagues. Undeterred, he managed to make several busts and did his job well. When asked about the transition many years later, Bradshaw said, When I was in the Pagan Motorcycle Club, I'm robbing drug dealers. So doing this under the auspices of the law, this is very easy. I have the best skill set of anybody that went undercover. Hey, he has a point. 
Bradshaw spent 20 years working on the right side of the law, then retired to teach self-defense classes and wrote a book about his life called Jersey Tough, My Wild Ride from Outlaw Biker to Undercover Cop. I wonder who reads the audiobook. Hey there, weird historians. This episode is brought to you by Clean My Mac X, the best Mac cleaner app to clean and organize your Mac. Have you noticed your Mac struggling lately? It may be bogged down with unused apps, a bunch of junk you don't even remember downloading, or even some nefarious malware. Clean My Mac X quickly and easily deletes tons of junk and malware, uninstalls those unused apps, and makes your Mac faster, safer, and more organized. You know, so you can get back to watching Weird History. With over 14 years on the market and users in over 185 countries, including at least one person in Antarctica, Clean My Mac X is the best tool for keeping your Mac running like the day you bought it. The app's sleek, intuitive design lets you scan your Mac for junk and malware using a single click with the Smart Scan feature. And using the app's uninstaller and updater tool lets you easily delete old, unwanted apps completely, leaving no stray files behind. And automatically update all the software you do use to make sure you're always using the latest version. Right now, you can try Clean My Mac for free using the link in the description. And if you decide to purchase, you can save 20% by using this special weird history link until the end of 2022. It is way cheaper than buying a new Mac. Before everyone's credit card information was being stolen from Target every few weeks, Kevin Mitnick was already a hacking legend. Mitnick received international attention in 1995, when he successfully hacked the Pacific Bell Telephone Company's computer system, which is apparently hard to do. Mitnick began his career as a grifter at age 12, when he acquired a ticket punch for the Los Angeles bus system and began using it on old transfer slips to get free rides. Four years later, he gained access to the Digital Equipment Corporation's computer system and copied all of their software. That's a bit more sophisticated than buying your own ticket punch, but you gotta learn to walk before you can run. After serving a year in jail, he was at it again. Mitnick executed his legend-making hack on Pacific Bell's voicemail computers while he was still on supervised release from prison, which is pretty bold. A warrant was issued for his arrest, and he went on the run for the next few years. It was sort of like the movie War Games, except the stakes were slightly lower than nuclear war. Using a mix of cloned cellular phones to mask his location, he evaded the FBI until 1995. He was tried and convicted of cloning hundreds of cell phones, possessing restricted devices, accessing a federal computer, and intercepting wire and electronic communications. He was basically every scam email rolled into a single human being. Following a five-year sentence, Mitnick went on to write books about computer security and hacking, founded a consulting firm, and continues to work as a consultant for the government. An unlikely Texas outlaw, Ben Thompson was born in England in 1842 and moved to the Lone Star State with his family at the age of seven. As a kid, Thompson was a violent little guy sort of like the weird kid who bites people. Every classroom has one. He fought, shot, and got into trouble with other boys throughout his teen years. When the Civil War broke out, he joined the losing side. As a Confederate soldier, he became a whiskey smuggler and a renowned gambler, which makes sense as those are related industries. He was discharged from service in 1863, and just as his guidance counselor predicted, it didn't take him long to get arrested. Thompson was jailed after getting into a shootout on the streets of Austin in 1865. While in jail, he bribed his jailers, escaped, and fled to Mexico. Afterward, he spent time in both Texas and Mexico until he was elected marshal in 1881. His time as a lawman would be short, however, as he was rubbed out by his enemies in an ambush in San Antonio, only three short years after he was elected to his post. Hailing from the mean streets of Mississippi, A. John Spradley was born with a chip on his shoulder. As a teenager in the 1870s, he got into a gunfight with two sons of a local farmer. Spradley was a quick draw with revolvers and easily dispatched them both. This act made him an outlaw, and he went on the run to Texas to avoid arrest or retaliation. Quick tip, if you're wanted for murder, don't go to Texas. Their state bird is the electric chair. Spradley's reputation for standing up to bullies, well, sure, that's one way of looking at it, actually helped further his career in Texas. 
He became a deputy sheriff in Nacogdoches County in 1880 and took a real shine to the role. After just one year, he was handed the big hat and elected sheriff. Spradley spent 30 years serving the county from 1881 to 1911. Throughout his time there, he had a long and storied career. He chased outlaws, thwarted bank robbers, and had his fair share of good old Texas gunfights. In 1912, he was appointed U.S. Marshal of Nacogdoches County at age 58, which he served dutifully. He continued to uphold the law until his death in 1940 from natural causes. Highwayman William Nevison was born in Yorkshire, England around 1650. He was a thief from an early age, and during his time in England and Holland, he stole everything that wasn't nailed down. His father-in-law eventually turned him into the authorities, which probably made things awkward at the next family dinner. Nevison was a unique bandit. Known as Swift Nick, he would courteously rob travelers, then charge them a fee to protect them from other highwaymen as they completed their journey. He was essentially running an old-timey protection racket. He operated on the Great North Road and was always polite to his targets, which is nice, but probably didn't take much of the sting out of being robbed. Nevison's activities earned him great notoriety, but he was eventually caught. Following a short stint in prison, he escaped to Flanders to join the Duke of York's army, the same Duke of York who later became King James II. He went from a courteous highwayman to a soldier in the King's army in just one prison break. Not bad, Swift Nick. Nevison returned to England and resumed his life of crime until he was finally hanged in 1685. Politeness only goes so far. During the 12th and 13th centuries, Eustace the Monk worked for both sides of the law and on both sides of the English Channel. And he did it all while being named Eustace. That's a difficult name for an outlaw. Born in northern France around 1170, he trained as a knight and a seaman before entering a monastery at age 20. Eustace abandoned monastic life to join the Count of Boulogne and King Philip II in their ongoing efforts to reclaim lands taken by England. After returning to the household of the Count, things didn't go well for him. He was accused of mismanagement of funds, which is a nice way of saying he was wetting his holy beak in the royal coffers. He fled into the forests as an outlaw and soon turned to piracy. Offering his services to King John in 1205, Eustace patrolled the English Channel, harassing French merchants until he was sent as an emissary to France in 1209. King Philip II of France did not care much for the former monk, but that didn't stop him from becoming a bit of a double agent. When the baronial revolt erupted against King John in 1214, Eustace provided weapons to the rebels. So King John revoked his English estates. He probably should have seen that coming, but when there's money to be made, Eustace just couldn't help himself. He continued to work as a mercenary and personally delivered the future French king, Louis VIII, to England in 1216. One year later, he was captured by the English and swiftly beheaded. They were not taking any more chances with that guy. So what do you think? Which of these outlaw stories surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.